Welcome to Zoom at Times TV, and here's your host, Anita Finley. So, every time that we have a, I would call this an author's interview, you know, I'm Anita Finley, I'll just introduce myself again, Anita Finley, and we do the Zoomer Times interviews. Uh, every time I have an author, I'm so inspired. I learn so much from authors. Of course, I read their books, but it's not the same as having someone right now face to face that you can see. And my guest this morning is Peter Wolfinger. And Peter is a he's a very interesting man. You know, you if you talk to him, he probably wouldn't tell you all the gory details of his life, but but he wrote it up in a book and, the, and it's called now. A Gang Member's Tale. I want to just show everybody the review we did, A Gang Member's Tale. And we, we made him a book of the month in our Boomer Times in September. And I've had a lot of comments on it. I mean, it, because down here in South Florida, we have a lot of people who probably were in gangs, but it's not the gangs that we think of now. So, Peter, will you explain the differences, please, in the gangs of today and the gangs when you were involved? Well... Years ago, a gang in the 50s and 60s was basically a group of guys that hung around. They used to sing on the corner, get a bottle of beer, you know, and then they would uh, play cards. And then what would happen is another group of boys would name, and then you would name yourself a gang, you know, because after watching Marlo Brando, you know, everybody wanted to be Marlo Brando, you know, that that's what you're doing. You know, other gangs would like to fight another gang. What for? Who the hell knows? But that's what they like to do. You know, in my case, I always got in fight with other gangs because I was always going into their neighborhood dating their girls. Uh -huh. you know? Sometimes <laughs> I could get out. Sometimes I couldn't get out, you know. So uh, we, uh, and back then uh, there wasn't many knives. It was mostly fists and uh, uh, antennas, you know, which hurt, man. When they, when you got hit by an antenna, you hurt. It, it hurt, it left a nice welt. And then, you know, you get a black eye, a few bruised ribs and maybe very few knives or guns as it is today. You know, but basically, uh, that's what the gangs were back then. You know, they like to call themselves tough and things. Everything okay? Did I lose? Yeah. No, I'm here. I'm I'm just listening. I'm just listening because you know you were talking about Marlon Brando, and um, and I remember that that was really very. He had the black jacket, right? Did you have a jacket? Black jacket? Oh, yeah. Everybody had a black motorcycle jacket, you know, big medallion that represented our gang. That was the first gang I joined, as you read in the book, Charlie came right. along. Right. And again, it was because I lived on a block. I was the only kid on a block. Otherwise, it was a candy store, a Chinese laundry mat. Remember the Chinese <laughs> laundry mat? My father's right. building, you know. You're right. And a gas station. So every time I left my block, I would meet a group of boys and they would torment you. You know, they wanted to fight, you know. But did they fight? Would they, would they, they didn't use knives? Did they, they just use their hands? Nothing? No knives. I, I, I very fair. I actually never seen a, a gang with a knife, except when I joined the Saints and I was arrested some boy in Brooklyn stabbed another boy with a knife. That's the first uh, knife. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are, are you still keep up? Are these friends of yours still today? Most of them are dead or in jail. Oh, uh -huh. you're kidding, really? No, I'm not kidding you. Most of them are dead or in jail. All my Italian friends from the, from the Saints, uh, the full blood Italians joined the family, you know. So I, I I lost contact with them, except you know, 
Anthony, I, I met a couple of years later, but, uh, and my one friend is a minister, Tony, from the Quantrells, so no. Well, the reason that, you know, it's important is because you thought enough to name your book A Gang Member's Tale, because you're, you really did a lot in the Army. The service was very important to you, and I want to spend the rest of the time talking about what you wrote in the book on that, but you didn't, that wasn't the title of your book. Well, because I tried, maybe I, I, maybe I titled it wrong, but a gang to me is a group of people. So I went from the Quantrells, a small group, to the Saints, which was a very large group, to Army, and they were all gangs. You could call the army a gang. I mean, I've been in bars where we were all army and the sailors came in and a fight broke out. <laughs> you know, so uh, one gang versus the other gang, or you may I say uh, the army versus the navy, which go on today. The difference is in the military, the Marines would fight the army in a bar, which I have been in Saigon. In fact, I got hit and went right through a glass window and I just stayed there because the MPs were going in swinging their clubs but the army would fight the navy the marines back and forth each group of soldiers or I call them gangs would fight each other but God help a stranger pick on one then whether you were the Army, the Navy, or the Marines, you would all get together and pick on that guy. Huh. So in other words, you're allowed to kill each other, but don't anybody interfere. <laughs> you have a very satiric you know? uh, way And that's to the rule today. And, and it's a brotherhood or a gang. I mean, I, if I wear my military hat and I walk into a bar and I don't know anybody, if they see my military hat, they'll walk over and say, welcome home, brother, because we were never officially liked when we came home. So yeah, um, they would right. welcome home, brother. I, I don't know that guy, but we would made friends. Mm -hmm. you know? And that, that's a gang. So when I, when I chose the title Gang Members Tale, it was in the back of my mind, as you shift through life, you join different gangs. Is it is gang the correct word? Well, maybe not. You know, you could say association or a club. You know, it wouldn't sell the same amount of books. A gang member's tale. I'm sure that's what people see, and they said, "Oh, I wonder what that's all about." Right? Yeah. Well, and the sales has been all right, not fantastic, but I have to really do my work. I mean, I have to go to club meetings and things, and I really don't do that. Uh, but it, yeah, I enjoy writing. I mean, you know, it's, some people consider it a hobby, you know, so I try my best. Yeah, well, it can't be a hobby if you write as well as you did. Your book was so interesting. And now he's just told me he has another book, and it's called, um, uh, Mr. So it's called My Soldier? Yes, My Soldier my soldier. And so you'd stick with the military, which is very interesting. That was one of the most important parts of your life, wasn't it? Besides meeting your wonderful wife and having your family. But it seems like the military really was important to you. Well, the, the military is important to every young man that goes in. Uh, I mean, you hear people that were in the military bitch and moan about it, but they always talk about it. Unfortunately, war was not a pleasant thing, but you always talk about it and you always stick together, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I believe the military is a family or a gang. You know, if you, if you join the military, I, I don't care what military you join or what position you were in, whether you were a cook, a general, a private, which, by the way, I worked my way up to sergeant and worked my way down to private. Uh, you're always a member of that family or gang. You know, you might be kidding. 
let, let me ask you about the, the Coast Guard. We, you know, we don't usually talk to many servicemen from the Coast Guard. How was that for you? Well, the, the, the Coast Guard originally, I was, I had to make money and I didn't know how my friend says, let's join the Coast Guard. And now I'm married, you know, I'm saying, well, how am I going to make money? I'm working. I said, what's the Coast Guard? He goes, man, it's a racket. You go there on the weekend, you're treated like gentlemen, no guns, no digging holes, no jumping out of plane. I said, oh, that's for me. He forgot to tell me you go on a 44 foot boat and you go three miles out to sea where the waves are 10 feet tall and you try to get some idiot that went out there with a sailboat. So that's what I did. And uh, I did that in Shinnecock and it, and it was a it was very interesting. It was reserves. You meet all walks of life, you know, all men at different things. And when you go out for a rescue, you don't you, they ask for volunteers, but nobody ever says no. You know, there's a storm out there. There's nobody that's going to say no. You're going to go out anyway. And uh, I went out and I, uh, I uh, got a trawler three miles past the sea buoys, which means you don't see land. He lost the screw and we towed him in. And then we had a sailboat. We had a stubborn guy that just refused to leave his sailboat and we we're going into what they call a, well, uh, it's like you're going into a bay, but on each side, there's a lot of rocks and the waves are really hitting and we have them in tow. And I wasn't the coxswain, the coxswain means the skip of the ship at the time. And you can't be a coxswain of a boat in a coast guard unless you pass the test to know the waters. So we're telling this guy, come on, you got to get off. We, we can't hold that boat any longer. So, or we're going to go up against the rocks. So the guy, guy says, I'm not going, I'm not going. So then we said, well, we're going to cut you free because we're not going to go down with you. And finally he got on, when he got on, the Sailboat hit the side of the rocks out in Shinnecock and just got totally destroyed. And then another one was a guy, we got a May Day, we went out there and, and we seen two people floating around in the water. Brand new, half a million dollar sailboat. And it sunk on its main voyage. They don't know why, they just said smoke came out. So we helped the woman out. I guess she must have been out. 25, 26, and she had on one of those French bikini, uh, bikinis. Oh, 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 wasn't that a shame? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. We forgot about the guy in the water. <laughs> Roll around there, putting a blanket on her, asking if she wants something to drink and something, and we get, help, help. Oh, I said, oh, shit, we got to get that guy. <laughs> so we got that guy. <laughs> and then, of course, the other one was where... Uh, the vice president of Dying Bank, he he was a little scared and he wouldn't move. So I jumped aboard and I grabbed him. I said, come on, you got to, this boat's going down. I don't want to go with it. And I, I just got him back on when his boat went down. So he wrote, wrote a letter of accommodation for us, which of course, in the book, you know, my wife went crazy, you know. Because she always thought I was a little reckless. Yeah. So but, but I promised was... her I would go to uh, New York Harbor. The, the first chance I can, I'll join security. So, but out of all of them in Shinnecock and Search and Rescue, the most one I truly felt we were appreciated was a guy was in a rowboat with his little girl. And that boat was banging up against the bridge and we got there and he just gave us his daughter. And you could see the relief. Sometimes I pray, I, I cry when I, I think of it. Yeah, that was really something, wasn't it? Just his face. 
his face of relief. Yeah. Now, well, now you I, have sound, a I sound like a wuss. But no, I, you don't. I love that about you. No, no, everyone has. It's very healthy to be there. You're very sensitive, and that's made you a good husband. It's made you a good writer, actually. Don't feel badly about that. Well, uh, I did go to Northport because I didn't have no feelings when I first came home from Nam. But the picture of that man's face when we got his daughter yeah. was the best out of them all. Wow. It would have been nice to have had a picture of that. Well, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> I was busy trying to stay alive. <laughs> I know. I know. I know that. And then when I... I well, when I went back into New York, uh, we did security, rode around, checked boats. You know, uh, so you never got seasick, I gather, because I get seasick on boats, but you don't even know what that means. I, I, I'd be lying to you. Everybody heaves their cookies in the seaman's term once. You know, you heave your cookies. Now, when I was in that uh, typhoon in Nam. I didn't heat my cookies because I was scared shit that I was going to die. So I was busy sure. doing something else, like trying to save my ass, you know. But uh, no, if you go out, you could be, you could get seasick on calm water too. If you watch the water, you're going to get sick. You know, you got to yeah. keep yourself busy. Well, I want to go back to what you just were talking about Vietnam. We didn't cover that, but you covered it very well in your book and. And I think in that last interview, I told you about a man, I think he was a captain and, and he's, a, he was, he's a great man. And he said that he was really, people were so mean to him when he came home from Vietnam. And did you feel that same thing? I think you said you did. Yes, yes. Uh, well, you gotta remember our society split into two sections when the Vietnam War came on. One was the hippies that like, what we considered freedom, drugs, sex, which I I would have liked that part too. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and then the establishment, actually your military personnel was the establishment. So, and so when I came home, I couldn't really find anybody to relate to. You know, because if, if you said, oh, I'm a veteran, right away, you're a baby killer, <laughs> you know? Oh, I, really? Oh, yeah. You, you get called baby killer and all that stuff. And then I really didn't realize that it was a television war until I came home and seen my father. My father, when I left, my father had jet black curly hair. When I came home, it was gray. And I, I couldn't understand wow. why. You know, you know, I'm a young guy. I'm, 24 or something, excuse me. Shouldn't uh, let a tear cry. So he and, was very worried about you, it sounds like. Well, my mother said that I, of course, I would write letters and where I was going on my patrol boat. I was in Saigon, Long and Ben Hong. And then on the TV, it would show being attacked, and my father would think I was there. Oh. Uh. You know? So he was getting gray hair, you know, his hair went gray for that. I mean, you know, right. all parents worry, you know. And you know, that when you join the military, everybody thinks it's for your God and country. But when you join the military and you meet your brothers and sisters in the military and you get in a fight or a position where you have to save yourself, you're doing it for your brother. That's next to you or your sister or your team you know it's not really for your country your country might have put your ass there but who's protecting and having your back is your fellow brother and sister and that's what you think about when you're in a battle you don't think about like that incident with lee with the gunboat I wasn't thinking about my country. Should I shoot the guy? I shouldn't think of that. I was thinking about Lee. Hey, Lee, spin, I'm going to spin around. I'm going to leave ourselves open, you know. And, and, and that's what brings the men and women in the armed forces closer because we all had to depend on each other to survive. 
of course. No, I want, I, I need to stop it for a minute because I've been so interested in what you've been saying. I forgot to tell people who you are again. Uh, you are listening to the author, Peter Wolfinger, who wrote A Gang Member's Tale. He is calling in from um, in, in Florida. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who are listening other places. And um, I just have to tell you that uh, he is one of the most interesting people. He has a wonderful wife, Judy. I don't want to forget to talk to her about that. But he lives in the villages and um, he's a great man. He just wrote another book. We'll have to look at that one. But keep going. I just about what you've said. I think these are beautiful words, actually. We don't what you're saying now, Peter, we don't really hear in all our television and news and all that. I love the way you're putting this. It's really beautiful. Well, anybody that watches a war movie or a, a military movie, what do you do? When you watch Band of Brothers, what do you think? You, you think America, here we come, they're fighting communists no. and stuff? No. Right? Well, I mean, that's what the average, uh, look at me. I even took a a Sudafed, so my nose wouldn't run in, run in anyway. But, Sorry. but when people watch movies like that, they're watching a battle and stuff, but the person that really is in that movie in real life isn't thinking about diddly shit except surviving mm -hmm. and helping his brother survive or sister. That's, that's what brings the military members together. It's not. I think that's why Private Ryan was such a famous movie. Yes, it is. You know, and it's funny. Is there racial tension in military? Yes, there is between them. But God help anybody that picks on a black or white while they're wearing the same uniform. They'll come together in a heartbeat and beat anybody that touches them. Of course, again, it's brotherhood and sisterhood that keeps us together because we went through the same thing. We fought together to survive. We ate, we dug holes, we shot. I mean, everybody together as a family. So you become a family. You well, know? I wish that I, I want everyone to know about his book. I hope you'll buy it. Um, he is a very, very sweet, honest man. You can see that. And his book is called A Gang Member's Tale. And um, you can get that by going on to Google. Uh, you go to, I'm sorry, Amazon.com. Just go to Amazon.com and order it. It's, uh, it'll keep you inspired and it'll keep you very busy reading it. And a lot of you will probably, if you're from New York, will like to read about some of the experiences in, the, in his early years. And then if you were in the military, you'll really appreciate it. And, um, and he's been, you know, he's really a terrific, uh, he's a terrific writer and I'm, I'm looking forward to his next book. Uh, and, and that's, you become an author, isn't it? From military to an author, right? And in your next book uh, uh, is going to be a love story, you said. It's a novel, a love story. Yes, it's a love story, yes. It's, uh... You have your dog with you. Show everybody your dog. Oh. Bella. Oh, oh, what's his name? Bella. That's Bella. That's her. That's Bella. Oh, there. isn't she adorable? Oh, that's lovely. So, you know, um, you you should be very pleased. And I know we haven't talked about Judy this time. I think we did last time, but she apparently has been a major supporter of you and everything you've done. Yes, my wife is very rare. My brother thinks she married underneath herself. <laughs> uh, but, uh, she always supported me in whatever I did and uh, uh, she always worried about me she just thought yeah. I didn't think I just did spontaneously you know like if you're reading a book right. uh, she wouldn't let me belong to the police even though I could have walked right in all my uncles back then were in it and stuff because she's afraid I was going to get hurt and then when the <laughs> hole blew up in my face she wanted me to quit you know she was always saying you know I don't want to lose you so don't stop uh -oh. doing stupid stuff and I was very fortunate in the fact that my wife was, to me, in my eyes, extremely beautiful. And 
Well, she uh, was in the book too. I saw that, the her picture. And uh, to a lot of other people, she was extremely beautiful. That's why my brother says she married Benita. I think <laughs> he had a crush on it, tell you the truth. <laughs> You know, and, Peter, uh, we've run out of time. I hate to say that to you. It's been so mesmerizing. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. And I hope that your hand feels better. And um, I'm hoping we can get you back on to do this. You're, you're very interesting. And I think people are smiling after this wonderful interview. It'll go on YouTube. And we really appreciate it. We hope your you know, hand uh, gets well, thank you. You know, healed quickly. And, uh, thank and thank you again. Stay well. Oh. Same here. And Don, everybody have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The same to you. And we'll talk again. Okay. Take Bye, care. everybody. Thank you for joining us. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and everything that goes with it. Stay safe, everyone.